Right now, are you a single person or a married couple just trying to stay safe during this pandemic amid all of these coronavirus variants? So the big question is, what will you do for Valentine's Day that is both staying safe and reasonably priced? Well, I have an answer for you. And it's a very great and special offer that you can get right now and then only on the Love and Stuff page. You will have a great afternoon filled with short films, music, poetry, and prizes sure to fill you up with love. And we all could use a little bit more love in this pandemic, right? If you want to spend your time on Valentine's Day loving yourself and or your boo or bae, but that means to leave the couch, then Love's Alive at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Valentine's Day is for you because it gives you a great and enjoyable afternoon for a reasonable price. You can click the link below to register for the event. 15% of the net proceeds will go toward independent artists. Why am I here to help you to enjoy this event? I am Marcus Holmes, the facilitator of the Love and Stuff community, and I'm a love activist who believes in the power of love and the power of community. Our community is filled with singles, married couples, and others that will tell you and testify to the power of love and that love is alive. Sunday's event will feature a short film from Mushad Moore entitled First Date, great music, prizes such as the Glam Doctor Soft Lips, and a cash prize. So you don't want to miss this event. Click the link below to register for this event. So if you're in love, looking for love, recently come out of love, or even if you've given up on love, join us and experience that love's alive for just $4.99. That's right. $4.99 is all that you'll pay for an afternoon of wonderful events and prizes. Get your ticket right now. And good evening or good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are around the world. We had the pleasure earlier today to interview a young man who is in Nigeria, in Uyo. Nigeria. And so right now it's morning for them. And so good morning to any of those folks in Nigeria that may be watching us. I am Marcus Holmes and I'm springboarding from the Love and Stuff platform right now. Though we are live, we are restreamed to the LinkedIn Live um, page on the Marcus Our Homes, uh, Twitch TV, YouTube events, and the Marcus Our Homes on Facebook with yet another Black History moment. We within the Love and Stuff community, decided to do a Black History moment every day this month on 28 days, even though there are many within our collective that are 365 Black. We wanted to utilize the month of February, as has been set aside, to honor and reflect and celebrate the brilliance of Black life, the contributions that African Americans and those of African descent have made to America to really make it a great place. And we're hoping that it will be an even greater place than some of our recent experiences. And so we continue in this week, um, our focus on the writings and writers within the African American diaspora. And so we continue today with a, a writer from the Harlem, Harlem Renaissance period, Jean Toomer. Just share, I'm going to share a little bit of background and then I will read a few of his pieces. Jean Toomer, born Nathaniel Pinchback Toomer on December 26, 1899 in Washington, D.C., was the only son of Nathan Eugene Toomer, a Georgia planter who had been born into slavery, and Nina Pinchback, the daughter of PBS Pinchback, a Louisiana politician who, during Reconstruction, served as the state's lieutenant governor and briefly as acting governor and was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1873, but did not, dis uh, did not serve owing to the const uh, contestation of his election. 
Tumor's parents were of mixed race and like Tumor, very light skinned. His parents separated when he was very young. He grew up in the household of his maternal grandfather. Most, if not all of his early age years were spent in Washington, DC. He later commented that he didn't really live in an African-American neighborhood until he was a teenager. Following a short residence in upstate New York with his mother and her second husband, Toomer returned to Washington following her death in 1909 and graduated in 1914 from the elite all-Black M Street School renamed Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School in 1916. Toomer enrolled in classes at a variety of schools, including the University of Wisconsin, the Massachusetts College of Agriculture, the American College of Physical Training in Chicago, the University of Chicago, the City College of New York, and New York University, but did not earn an undergraduate degree. He changed his name to Gene Toomer and in his early 20s lived in Greenwich, Greenwich Village, where he met writers including Van Wick Brooks and Witter Biner and, former, and formed a close relationship with Waldo Frank. In the fall of 1921, he took a temporary teaching job at an agricultural school in Sparta, Georgia, an experience that became the basis for much of Cain, a fusion of fiction, poetry, and drama that was publicized by Bonnie and Live Wright in 1923. His poetry and prose appeared in magazines such as Broom, The Liberator, Nomad, and The Little Review, and Cain, upon publication, received wide critical acclaim. Toomer became interested in the mystical ideas of George Ivanich uh, Gurdjieff. In 1924, in New York, he met A. R. Orish, an English disciple, and spent that time uh, at the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man in France. Returning to America, he conducted workshops in New York, Chicago, and Portage, Wisconsin. He married the writer Marjorie Latimer in 1931, and their marriage led to a national anti-misogynation scandal, excuse me, when reported on by the time. At the time of the marriage, Toomer issued a statement in which he wrote, there is a new race in America. I am a member of this new race. It is neither white nor black nor in between. It is the American race. Latimer died the following year as a result of giving birth to their daughter, Marjorie. Toomer, uh, Toomer married Marjorie Content in 1934 and thereafter settled permanently in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. After the appearance of Cain, he continued to publish poems and prose pieces in magazines, but did not widely circulate much of his writing, including novels, short stories, poetry, and plays composed during that period. Essentials, definition and aphorisms, and a fiction and some facts, small privately printed volumes, appeared in 1931. And on the long poem, The Blue Horizon, a meditation on a raceless America on which he had begun work in the early 20s, was published in the poetry anthology, The New Caravan, in 1936. He traveled to India in 1939. He joined the Religious Society of Friends, the Quakers, in 1940. In later years, he published An Interpretation of Friends Worship, 1947, and The Flavor of Man, 1949. His writings were collective, collected posthumously, posthumously excuse me, in The Wayward and the Seeking, a collection of writings by June, uh, Jean Toomer, 1980, and The Collected Poems of Jean Toomer, 1988. Toomer was in poor health in his last decades. He died March 30th, 1967 in Doylestown. I was moving quite quickly through that, I think, because I'm excited to read some of the work. Some of the work has strong themes and language. So I am working to be careful uh, and mindful of the platforms uh, given the various themes. And so, I may substitute a word or so in some of the readings, but I, I definitely want to read some of uh, some mixture of the poetry and fiction um, 
kind of short story. So uh, we'll read a few from this great work, body of work of Gene Toomer. The first we will read is Corintha. Her skin is like dusk on the eastern horizon. Oh, can't you see it? Oh, can't you see it? Her skin is like dusk on the eastern horizon when the sun goes down. Men had always wanted her, this Corintha. Even as a child, Corintha carrying beauty, perfect as dusk when the sun goes down. Old men rode her hobby horse upon their knees. Young men danced with her at frolics when they should have been dancing with their grown-up girls. God grant us youth, secretly prayed the old man. The young fellows counted the time to pass before she would be old enough to mate with them. This interest of the male who wishes to ripen a growing thing too soon could mean no good to her. Corintha at 12 was a wild flash that told the other folks just what it was to live. At sunset, when there was no wind and the pine smoke from over by the sawmill hugged the earth and you couldn't see more than a few feet in front, her sudden darting past you was a bit of vivid color, like a black bird that flashes in light. With the other children, one could hear some distance off, their feet flopping in the two inch dust. Corintha's running was a whir. It had the sound of the red dust that sometimes made a spiral in the road. At dusk, during the hush just after the sawmill had closed down, and before any of the women had started their supper getting ready songs, her voice, high pitched, shrill, would open one's ears to itching. But no one ever thought to make her stop because of it. She stoned the cows and beat her dog and fought the other children. Even the preacher who caught her at mischief told himself that she was as innocently loved as a November cotton flower. Already, rumors were out about her. Homes in Georgia are most often built on the two-room plan. In one, you cook and eat. In the other, you sleep and their love goes on. Corintha had seen or heard, perhaps she had felt, her parents loving. One could but intimate one's parents for to follow them was the way of God. She played home with a small boy who was not afraid to do her bidding. That started the whole thing. Old men could no longer ride her hobby horse upon their knees, but young men counted faster. Her skin is like dusk. Oh, can't you see? Her skin is like dusk when the sun goes down. Corintha is a woman. She who carries beauty perfect as dust, perfect as dust when the sun goes down. She has been married many times. Old men remind her that a few years back they rode her hobby horse upon their knees. Corintha smiles and indulges them when she is in the mood for it. She has contempt for them. Corintha is a woman. Young men still run to make her money. Young men go to the big cities and run on the road. Young men go away to college. They all want to bring her money. These are the young men who thought that all they had to do was to count time. But Corintha is a woman and she has had a child. A child fell out of her womb onto the bed of pine needles in the forest. Pine needles are smooth and sweet. They are elastic to the feet of rabbits. A sawmill was nearby. Its pyramidal sawdust piled smoldered. It is a year before one completely burns. Meanwhile, the smoke curls up and hangs in odd wraiths around the tree, curls up and spreads itself out over the valley. Weeks after Corintha returned home, the smoke was so heavy, you tasted it in the water. Someone made a song. Smoke is on the hills, rise up. Smoke is on the hills, oh rise. And take my soul to Jesus. Corintha is a woman. Men do not know that the soul of her was a growing thing ripened too soon. They will bring their money. They will die not having found it out. Corintha at 20, 
carrying beauty, perfect as dusk when the sun goes down. Corintha. Her skin is like dusk on the eastern horizon. Oh, can't you see it? Oh, can't you see it? Her skin is like dusk on the eastern horizon when the sun goes down. Love that piece. I am also going to share some more pieces we are sharing from Jean Toomer's Cane, which is a collection of different styles of writing that Jean Toomer did, poetry and uh, fiction and short stories. The next that I will read, Reapers. Black reapers with the sound of steel on stones are sharpening skies. I see them place the hones in their hip pockets as a thing that's done and start their silence winging one by one. Black horses drive a mower through the, re through the weeds and there a field rat startled squealing bleeds. His belly close to ground, I see the blade. Blood stain, continue cutting weeds and shade. and November cotton flower, as it was referenced in Corintha. Bow weevils coming and the winter's cold made cotton stalks look rusty seasons old and cotton scarce as any Southern snow was vanishing the branch so pinched and slow, failed in this function as the autumn rake, drought fighting soil had caused soil to take. All waters from the stream, dead birds were found in wells a hundred feet below the ground. Such was the season when the flower bloomed. Old folks were startled and it soon assumed. Significance, superstition saw, something it had never seen before. Brown eyes that love without a trace of fear, beauty so sudden for that time of year. I'm going to move to an, another set of pieces. Calling Jesus. Her soul is like a little thrust tailed dog that follows her, whimpering. She is large enough, I know, to find a warm spot for it. But each night when she comes home and closes the big outside storm door, the little dog is left in the vestibule, filled with chills till morning. Someone, ye old Jesus, soft as a cotton ball brush against the milk pot cheek of Christ, will steal in and cover it that it need not shiver and carry it to her where she sleeps upon clean hay cut in her dreams. When you meet her in the daytime on the streets, the little dog keeps coming. Nothing happens at first. And then when she has forgotten the streets and alleys and the large house where she goes to bed of nights, a soft thing like fur begins to rub your limbs. And you hear a low, scared voice, lonely, calling, and you know that a cool something nozzles moisture in your palms. Sensitive things like nostrils quiver. Her breath comes sweet as honeysuckle whose pistils bear the life of coming song. And her eyes carry to where builders find no need for vestibules, for swinging on iron hinges, storm doors. Her soul is like a little thrusted tail dog that follows her whimpering. I've seen it tagging on behind her up streets where Chestnut Street flowered, where dusty asphalt has been freshly sprinkled with clean water, up alleys where Negroes sat on low doorsteps before tumble shanties and sang and loved. At night when she comes home, the little dog is left in the vestibule, nosing the crack beneath the big storm door, filled with chills to morning. Someone, he old Jesus, soft as the bare feet of Christ, moving across bales of Southern cotton, 
will still in and cover it that it need not shiver and carry it to her where she sleeps, cradled in dream fluted cane. Karma. Wind is in the cane. Come along. Cane leaves swaying, rusty with talk, scratching choruses above, the guineas squawk. Wind is in the cane. Come along. Karma in overalls and strong as any man stand behind the old brown mule, driving the wagon home. It bumps and groans and shakes as it crosses the railroad track. She riding it easy. I leave the men around the stove to follow her with my eyes down the red dust road. Negro women driving a Georgia chariot down an old dust road. Dixie Pike is what they call it. Maybe she feels my gaze. Perhaps she expects it. Anyway, she turns. The sun, which has been slanting over her shoulder, shoots primitive rockets into her mangroved, gloom, yellow flower face. Hi, yep. God has left the Moses people for the Negro. Get up. Using veins to slap the mule, she disappears in the cloudy rumble at some indefinite point along the road. The sun is hammered to a band of gold. Pine needles like Mazda are brilliantly aglow. No rain has come to take the rustle from the falling sweet gum leaves. Over in the forest across the swamp, a sawmill blows its closing whistle. Smoke curls up. Marvelous web spun by the spider sawdust pile. Curls up and spreads itself pine high above the branch. A silver band a single silver band along the Eastern Valley. A black boy. You are the most sleepiest man I ever seed. Sleeping beauty, cradled on a gray mule, guided by the hollow sounds of cowbells, head for them through a rusty cotton field. From down the railroad track, the chug chug of a gas engine announces that the repair gang is coming home. A girl in the yard of a whitewashed shack, not much larger than the stack of worn ties, piled before it, sings. Her voice is loud. Echoes like rain sweeps the valley. Dust takes the polish from the rails. Lights twinkle in scattered houses. From afar, a sad, strong song. Pungent and composite. The smell of farmyards is the fragrance of the woman. She does not sing, her body is a song. She is in the forest dancing, torches flare, juju man, gree, gree, Witch doctors, torches go out. The Dixie Pike has grown from a goat path in Africa. Night, Foxy slicks back her ears and barks at the rising moon. Wind is in the corn, come along. Corn leaves swaying, rusty with talk, scratching choruses upon the guineas squawk. Wind is in the corn, come along. Karma's tale is the crudest melodrama. Her husband's in the gang, and it's her fault he got there. Working with a contractor, he was away most of the time. She had others. No one blames her for that. He returns one day and hung around the town when he picked up weak old boast and rumors. Bain accused her. She denied. He couldn't see that she was becoming hysterical. He would have liked to take his fist and beat her who was strong as a man, stronger, 
Words like corkscrews wormed to her string. It fizzled out. Grabbing a gun, she rushes from the house and plunged across the road into a cane break. There, in quarter heaven, shone the crescent moon. Bain was afraid to follow till he heard the gun go off. Then he wasted half an hour gathering the neighbor men. They met in the row where lamplight shows tracks dissolving in the loose earth about the cane. The search began. Moths flickered the lamps. They put them out. Really because she still might be live enough to shoot. Time and space have no meaning in a cane field. No more than the interminable stalks. Someone stumbled over her. A cry went out. From the road, one would have thought that they were cornering a rabbit or a skunk. It is difficult carrying dead weight through cane. They placed her on the sofa. A curious nosy somebody looked for the wound. This fussing with the clothes aroused her. Her eyes were weak and pitiable for so strong a woman. Slowly, then like a flash, Bane came to know that the shot she fired with adverted head was aimed to whistle like a dying hornet through the cane. Twice deceived and one deception proved the other. His head went off. Slash one of the men who'd helped, the man who stumbled over her. Now he's in the game. Who was her husband? Should she not take others, this karma's strongest man, whose tale, as I have told, it is the crudest melodrama? Wind is in the cane. Come along. Cane leaves swaying, rusty with talk, scratching choruses above the guinea's squawk. Wind is in the time. Come along. And before I read uh, a final piece, I just want to remind you tomorrow is our last day and look of the writings in the African-American experience. Next week, we'll talk about more public and popular figures, which includes celebrities, pastors, and politicians. I hope that you will join us as we look at the life and reflect upon the contributions and sacrifices of those of African-American descent and African descent. I also want to remind you that Sunday we have a wonderful event that's happening. We'll be live on Facebook. For those of you that aren't on Facebook, you can get your tickets. Um, we will drop the link in the comments. And I want to play just a bit of the feature, uh, one of the feature films. So there will be uh, independent artists whose feature film shorts will be included. So those are like short movies. Um, we certainly wanted to raise up the voices of independent artists, particularly in Black History Month. And we will also have music. A DJ will be there, the DJ bassologist, for you to have some Valentine's Day dance with a special guest who we will hopefully shortly announce. Um, and you'll get an opportunity to win prizes, including uh, cash prizes, some wonderful products from the Glam Doctor who does uh, a number of different products, but we'll be giving away some of her soft lips uh, products from that product line. And it'll be a wonderful afternoon. It's $4.99. Can't beat that for under $5 right on your couch. And I want to just play a small part of the short. Hopefully our video um, work will be just fine. trying to figure out oh my god ah, look the guy he showed me that's his brother brother look that's him in the background of all the pictures So just a small part, and hopefully we're able to show you uh, one celebrity 
has already shouted out the event and we're so excited. What's up? My name is Sean Patrick Thomas, and I'm sending a shout out to Marcus and the Love and Stuff community for Love's Alive on Valentine's Day. Hey, save me a dance. So you don't want to miss the event. Again, you can go to the Love and Stuff page and get your ticket for $4.99. Um, it's an amazing opportunity, and we want to encourage you to do that. I'm going to read one more uh, piece uh, as we highlight um, Jean Toomer today. Song of the Sun. Pour, oh pour that parting soul in song. Oh pour it in the sawdust glow of night into the velvet pine smoke air tonight and let the valley carry it along and let the valley carry it along. Oh, land and soil, red soil and sweet gum tree, so scant of grass, so profligate of pines. Now, just before an epic's sun declines, Thy son in time, I have returned to thee. Thy son, I have in time returned to thee. In time, for though the sun is setting on. A songlit race of slaves it has not set. Though late, O soil, it is not too late yet to catch thy plaintive soul, leaving soon gone, leaving to catch thy plaintive soul, soon gone. O Negro slaves, dark purple ripened plums, squeezed and bursting in the pine wood air, passing before they stripped the old tree bare, one plum was saved for me, one seed becomes an everlasting song, a singing tree, caroling softly souls of slavery, what they were and what they are to me, caroling softly souls of slavery. Jean Toomer, one of the considered one of the most pro prolific and critically acclaimed writers of the Harlem Renaissance time period, whose work we celebrate and reflect on today. I hope that you will click share and tag someone uh, to join us as we continue this journey. And tomorrow we will uh, complete this journey of writings, reviewing of writing specifically as we look at some of the writings of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, tomorrow. And so then we will begin public figures, celebrities, preachers, politicians. We will begin looking at their journey next week as we continue to move throughout this month and celebrate the great accomplishments, the brilliance and excellence and the sacrifices of people of African-American descent and African descent. I'm Marcus Holmes. Thank you so much for joining us and have a grateful evening.